This is Bounty, the Atari 8-bit podcast. This is Antic, the Atari 8-bit podcast. I'm Kevin Savitz. Greg Gibbons was the creator of Automated Library 2, software for running school libraries, which was available for the Atari 8-bit and Apple II computers. There's an article about the software in the April 1985 issue of American Libraries Journal. The Automated Library 2 is a barcode circulation system that runs on the Atari line of microcomputers. The program, designed for school libraries circulating 30 to 500 items per day, checks books in and out, compiles overdue lists, and prints class records and daily circulation summaries by Dewey Decimal Numbers. Software developer Gregory Gibbons studied the day-to-day activities of a junior high school librarian and then designed a system to automate as much of the repetitious work as possible. The program was extensively tested on a Los Angeles school for over a year before its release. All inputs are prompted with simple English. The system is so easy to use that the test library used students to perform most of the operations. The program produces barcodes for the books in the library and student ID barcodes, which are entered into the computer and attached to books and student IDs. If the student is authorized to check out books, the computer will make a short beep and print OK to check out books on the screen. If the student is on the overdue list, the computer makes a different noise to alert the staff. At the end of the day, the librarian instructs the computer to perform a daily update, which incorporates all transactions into the database. The update takes about 15 minutes per 1,000 students and automatically generates a new overdue list that can be printed at any time. The program works best with 200 to 3,000 students, although a larger number of students will simply cause the program to take a little longer to update each day. The Automated Library 2 runs on the Atari 800, 800XL, and 1200XL computers. The system costs $700, including the light wand. This interview took place on May 24, 2018. My mother is a school libra- was a school librarian, hmm. and uh, I got into let's see, I got into computers when I was a freshman in college. I took a class in programming and loved it. Actually, before then, I did work. My my uh, parents brought home a computer terminal with an acoustic modem. Um, yeah, that's how old I am. <laughs> uh, had an acoustic modem, and uh, we played uh, some games on it at home um, that were really rudimentary, but it was pretty interesting to me. Um, and then I, uh, let's see. So I went to college. And I took a class in computer programming and I loved it. And so I became a computer science major. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, uh, so my, when I graduated college, I was, I got a job as a software engineer and, um, did that for about two years and then went back to school to get my MBA. Where were you software engineering? Uh, so I live in, uh, I live in Los Angeles Mm -hmm. and I was, the company was ITT. Okay. So they have, they had a division that made, uh, I, I've been doing a embedded real time software pretty much all my career. And so, uh, which meant that I was at the time that was, uh, assembly language when I, so when I went to get my MBA, uh, one of the classes that I took was, uh, information technology, um, And one of the things that they, one of the projects they asked us to do was to evaluate uh, information systems. This is really before IT was a thing. Mm -hmm. Um, Most companies didn't have an IT department yet, but it was, you know, it was kind of fledgling at the time. Anyway, uh, this class asked us to evaluate an information system that was manual and could be automated. Um, and so I, um, asked my mom if I could evaluate the way she did, uh, ran, ran her library. Um, so she was doing, it was an entirely manual system. They would, this was back in the dark ages. They would, uh, 
check out books by having a little card in the front of the book and you would sign your name on the card and mm-hmm. they would keep the cards and you could take the book. Uh, and then they had this big, uh, dr- huge drawer of cards from books of all the books that were checked out. Anyway, so I did, so I, you know, I kind of documented all how all of this stuff worked and wrote up a report and gave it to my, turned it in for my class. And then as a courtesy to my mom, I gave her a copy of the report just so she could see what I had written up about her stuff. Mm -hmm. And, and like the last chapter or the last couple of pages of this report was, uh, how to, how it could be computerized to be more efficient. And for me, it was just a class, <clears throat> but my mom gave the report to her principal and her principal said, wow, it sounds great. Let's buy one. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so, and my mom came back to me and said, my principal says it's great and he wants to buy one. I go, uh, that, that was a hypothetical. <laughs> there isn't such a thing, mm-hmm. <laughs> but I suppose I could, write one for you if he wants to buy it. So and since I was getting my MBA, I, you know, I saw a, an opportunity to start a business. Uh, the timing wasn't great cause it was, that was like my first class as an MBA. So I spent the rest of the two years of getting my MBA. I was working like, uh, 35 hours a week and going to school full time and trying to, start write the software so I could start this company all at the same time. Hmm. There was a lot of nights I stayed up till three or 4 AM writing software. Hmm. So that's how I got into it. That's how I got, that's where my background in software came from. And that's where my uh, interest in libraries came from. It was never really a regular library. It was always meant for school libraries Mm -hmm. because it was a sort of smaller scale. Sure. Um, Oh, and coincidentally, I had an Atari 800 that I used to write all of my um, reports and projects on because I was big into word processing early. Probably uh, 90% of the people in my MBA class were all using typewriters. And I thought that was kind of, <laughs> that was dumb. I, I just don't have the <laughs> skill or taste to write, to type things on a typewriter without errors. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so anyway, so I had a, so I had an Atari that I was used for word processing. I think I was using uh, word. Yeah, it wasn't word perfect. I forget what the software was. Hmm. Uh, yeah, there were, there were several, um, there was paperclip and Atari writer and, uh, um, many choices really yeah i can i can i can see the little folder like a white booklet that it came in text wizards i forget sure anyway i mean text wizard um so what school did your did your mom teach at that that's the software got written for uh yeah it was a sutter junior high school in uh Tonoga park okay in california sure i grew up in southern california so uh, i was wondering if uh Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, Sutter Junior High. She, she was the librarian there from the time it opened until she retired. Huh. Um, so, so anyway, so yeah. I, I got the I got the system to work, uh, and she liked it so much that she showed her supervisor and uh, demonstrated it to several other schools, and I sold it to a couple of other schools in LA City Schools. And they liked it so much that um, they made a big deal out of it to their supervisor. And their supervisor said, wow, this is great. Um, It's such a good idea that we're going to put a hold on buying any other software and have LA City Schools computer division write software for us that is free. (laughs) (laughs) So so that shut me down. Wow. And it was was kind of, it was kind of a bad decision all around because, uh, they decided that they were going to write them for PCs, which mm-hmm. they did not have. Mm-hmm. This was way back when a PC uh, cost like four thousand dollars or so. Um, my my software would 
run on an Atari 400. So there was a point at which Atari 400s were like $100, I right. think. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they didn't need to do much typing because it was all, so the software, my software ran, you could, it would print out barcodes for student IDs that would just on labels that they put on student IDs. And it would, and it would print out barcodes that you could put in books where all of the, uh, the title and the copy number and the price and everything were all encoded in the barcode in the book. And then, uh, and then it also, I, I was able to buy a light reader wand from Hewlett Packard that actually plugged right into the Atari game port. Um, and that light reader wand was only like $70. Hmm. Um, and so, so you could read the barcode, so you could read a student ID and you could read a book barcode and then it would associate the student with the book and the student could take the book and uh, the computer would keep the record. Wow. Uh, was it storing all this to all the data just to floppy disk? Yes, uh, everything on floppy disk. So that was a little bit of a drawback of this system is that it would store, uh, basically it just stored all of the transactions for a full day on, on a floppy disk. And then you'd have to run a file update program every night where it would uh, take all the transactions of the day and log them to uh, sort of a master set of floppy disks where all of the books that were checked out by all of the students were kept on floppy. So that took like uh, a, maybe around three floppy disks. Mm-hmm. So you'd have the, you'd have the today's floppy disk with all of today's exchanges in one drive and uh, the master database in another drive. And it would, update it for a while and then it would tell you to change and it would update the second one and then the third one and then you'd be done. And, and the whole process took about 15, 20 minutes um, because there were floppy disks. Uh, but, you know, I mean, it was, it was manageable and it kept track. It did a really good job of keeping track of uh, all of the, all of the books that were checked out and, one of the things that it did that was a big bonus for the library was uh, when all of the books that were checked out were on little cards, if a student had a bunch of books that were overdue, um, the library staff didn't know because they couldn't go through all the cards all the time. Sure. So, um, so the student could just keep out checking out more and more and more books. Um, and then they had this huge task at the end of the year of going through all of the books that hadn't been checked in, all the cards, and creating a list of all the students who weren't allowed to graduate unless they paid their huge fine, um, which they, the student didn't necessarily even know about. Um, I don't know if you've had the same nightmare that I have of having a book be overdue for a year. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> <laughs> not that I'm not, not going to admit to that. I'll just put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, maybe it's because my mom is a librarian. Um, but uh, with my with the Atari system, if a student had a book that was overdue and they tried to check out another one, it would just beep them right away and say, you know, you can't check out this book because you have an overdue book. Uh, and it made their list of students who had overdue books, it cut it to like a tenth of what it had been the previous year. So it was a it was a big boon for them. Wow. So uh for me the economics of you know Atari computers were so inexpensive and so capable. It seemed like a really good thing. But um I think it was around that time that Apple announced their big uh, giveaway of uh, a, an Apple IIe computer to every school. Right. And so I, re- so I rewrote the software, which wasn't a big deal. It was all written in assembly language for mm. 6502. Wow. 
So I, re- I rewrote the software to run on an Apple and basically promoted it as uh, if, if you already have an Apple and you don't know what to do with it, here's a, here's a good thing. Hmm. Right? And did the, the barcode uh, reader, there was a version of the barcode reader that worked on the Apple, I assume? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I had to, I had to uh, wire it a little bit differently to get it to work on Apple, but yeah. Huh. So I'm curious, which, how many of these did you sell for the Atari? You know, approximately, I know it's been a while. How many did you sell for the, for the Apple? Not very many. I sold, I think I sold the, uh, I'm going to say a total of like seven systems is all. Hmm. So I sold, I sold one to uh, a school overseas, and I sold like three of them across the country and four of them to LA City Schools. And then when LA City Schools, so I live in Los Angeles, and that was my my big plan was to sell them to LA City Schools and get uh, good press from that, and then you know start trying to go national. And then when LA City Schools shut me down. Um, I didn't have, I didn't have any kind of, it was just me. I wasn't, uh, I didn't have any funding or anything. Yeah. So I couldn't go market it to other schools in other districts. So I kind of just let it go. Hmm. The thing I was going to say is, um, it was unfor- it was an unfortunate decision that, that LA city schools shut me down because, um, they, so I had the software that was running and the, the four librarians that bought it loved it, that it was made their running their library much easier and much more effective. Um, and then when they side decided to quit buying any software that they would write their own, it, it took them over five years before they got anything into the school that worked at all. <laughs> and, and ultimately after five years, it was, it had taken so long and it was so badly written that I don't, I'm not even sure that even today, like 30 years later that they have an integrated system that checks out books with barcodes. I mean, it was just a, it was a really massive error on their part and they could have negotiated me down to like virtually nothing. (laughs) I mean, I was not a, I was a young MBA student, but if they had come to me and said, you know, we're going to, we're going to stop buying these things. If I, if I had been smarter or if they, or if they had been smarter, I would have said, you know what, how about if you just lease mine for a hundred dollars a year until you get yours, you know, done mm-hmm. or, or $10 per school per year. Right. Yeah. I would have done it. I would have done that for ten dollars a year per school, and, and made a bunch more money. <laughs> and I, and I, I, I knew they wouldn't get it done in a in a year or two, but I didn't know it would take five or more years. Right. So it said here right. that the system cost seven hundred dollars. Was that just for the software, or did that include the the Atari hardware and everything? It did not include the hardware; just the software and uh, and the barcode reader. Mm. Uh, and, a, and an initial set of labels. So it was, uh, you know, I'm, the economics were that I didn't expect to sell thousands of these things. Um, and the, I think there was a competing system at the time called, uh, uh, shoot, I don't remember the name of it, but there was another there was another library, school library set of software that ran on a TRS-80. And it was somewhere in the neighborhood of nine, $900 or $1,000 just for the software. Wow. Vertically, vertically integrated software is, is at a totally different price level than commercial software, right? Oh, absolutely. Sure. Just sell a few at... Uh a lot of money as opposed to selling thousands for yeah. cheap. Yeah. I mean, uh, the market was never going to be 10,000 systems. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, How long anyway. did it take you to, to write the software? Uh, I 
had a version working within a year and then it took another year. So, uh, I kept adding on features like this. So I added a, I added a feature to do inventory. Um, inventory is like a huge task that, um, librarians have to do every year where they figure out how many books have been stolen or lost or whatever. Uh, and with my system, you could just go through and scan each book one time, and then you would you could do inventory in a tenth of the time that you would otherwise. Um, anyway, I added on some features like that uh, for another year or so. So the the one that you see the ad for the automated library two uh, had had most of that in it. So I would say two years to get to that point. Was there an automated library right. one? No, I took a cue from uh, I took a cue from DBase two. I don't know if you remember that that sure. program, but yeah, yeah. It, it, it came up with two just to say uh, this is. If there was a one, it would have been the prototype that my mom used. Um, the the implication was this is mature software and it and it it isn't uh, beta testing. Right. Uh, it's awesome. Did you um, create any other software for the Atari? Nothing commercial. Hmm. Well, I wrote I wrote some games just on my own, um, but nothing that I nothing that I sold. Huh. These are those are also machine language games. Yeah, everything I wrote was in assembly language. Wow. Yeah, I gotta say that's I I'm impressed. I mean, I know that was what you were studying and everything, but. To do a project like this in a Sunday language seems uh, like an aggressive move when mi- you, someone might have tried to do a fine job in, in BASIC, you know? Yeah. It, um, it, it, so BASIC is uh, much more productive initially. Um, the, so the thing that I did in assembly language, so I used the Atari macro, macro assembler. And for for those of your listeners who know macro assembly, I, I, I basically started off writing a bunch of macros. So I implemented um, methods in assembly language to do like uh, get string and put string essentially. Um, and then once I had done that once in assembly language, then I could just call them they ran an assembly, but it was as efficient for me to use one line of code to call the macro. So I did a lot of I did a lot of that. Just you know, initially just wrote a bunch of macros, and then I could use the macros to do a lot of what I needed to do. But it it wasn't possible to do so. Um, reading barcodes was all done in a, had to be in assembly language because all you get from the barcode reader. It was it, because it was really cheap. All it gave you was a single bit, which was a one or a zero, based on whether it was positioned over something dark or light. Right. So, so I had to time as the barcode reader passed over the barcode. I had to time how long a, it was returning a one or how long it was returning a zero, to try to figure out whether it was on a a narrow white band or a wide white band or a narrow black band or a wide black band. And there's no possible way that basic was fast enough to do that. Hmm. It seems like it would be really uh, uh, sensitive to how fast that the humans scanned across the barcode then. Um, Yeah, it was, it had to be adaptive. So it, um, there was some algorithms in there to figure out how long you spent total and figure out how fast you were span- scanning and then divide up that time into, you know, what's a long one and what's a short one. So it was adaptive so that you could, you could scan it pretty much any reasonable speed and it would figure it out. Very cool. Pretty. I was kind of proud of, of being able to do that with a, minimal input of a, you know, just a one or a zero coming from a light pen. I was also uh, kind of proud of, um, so I programmed an Epson MX80 dot matrix printer to print barcodes as well um, by outputting the graphics to it. So you could type in the, the name of a student or whatever, and it would figure out 
you know, how to, how to encode that in a barcode and then print that on a graphics printer on a label. Hmm. Um, and that probably had to be assembly language as well in order to drive the printer fast enough to be reasonable. Mm -hmm. Do you have a sense of, of how long this ran in those seven libraries that, that you sold it to? I, I don't. The last time I was, the last time I sort of checked, uh, my, my mom had retired and the librarian that took over for her was still using it. And I think that was 10 years later. Might have only been seven or eight, but it was a significant amount of time after I had moved on. I know they were still using it. Very cool. Do you know how you got this article in uh, American Libraries magazine? I was it a review of the system? Uh, it was a a kind of a half page news article about it. So uh, I don't. I okay. I advertised in um, School Library Journal and another magazine. So I had put out these ads to libraries to to try to sell it, and probably as a result of having that ad in there for a few issues. Um, I, I do know that somebody writing for some other magazine contacted me and said, can you send me a, can you send me a copy for a review? And so that probably is where it came from. Sure. That makes sense. So what haven't I asked you about that time that I should have? That's kind of the whole story of, of having written that software. Yeah. I do. Um, I would say I was, you know, really drawn to Atari's over anything else because because they were. I mean, they were really good computers for that time. Um, they basically they didn't have the expandability that Apple's had because of you know Apple had the slots that you could put cards in. Mm -hmm. um, but other than that, uh, they could do a, they were, I, I think they were seriously underappreciated. They, they could do, they had great power for their time. And they were unfortunately viewed mostly as a gaming computer. But they, I mean, they had all the computing capability of, a, of an Apple. And, th and that's why I w was drawn to it. That's why I used it. It was a, a really inexpensive, but, you know, it could do the same amount of processing for something like this, for bookkeeping or, um, you know, managing an information system. Um, that was really impressive to me. That's why I, that's why I really liked it. Mm -hmm. I will say, though, that after I rewrote it for the Apple, um, <laughs> the the one drawback of the system was that it took this this like twenty minutes to do this um, file update at the end of the day, mm -hmm. which was kind of annoying I think for people. You know, when when it's time to go home, the last thing you want to do is run file management software for half an hour. Um, so I re when I rewrote it for an Apple, I also. I'll let it run on a um, hard disk. And, and when it ran on a hard disk, it took like a minute and a half to do the <laughs> whole thing that took 30 minutes of floppy. <laughs> so that was, that was an unfortunate thing that it was really hard to get a, a reasonable cost hard disk for an Atari. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Tell me about what you do these days. I'm still a software engineer. Uh, I work in aerospace. Uh, I worked for a few, several years um, programming GPS. So I was one of the, I wrote most of the software for the uh, first GPS systems back back when nobody knew what GPS was. Mm. I had to get up at 4 a.m. when the satellite went. There was only like six satellites up instead of the 32 that are up now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
and we had to get up at 4 a.m. because that's the only time there were enough satellites to get a position. Um, right now, I just write, uh, I'm a software manager for a aerospace company that makes drones. Very cool. So t let's talk about what you have in your in your basement or attic. Do you have this software? Do you have the documentation? Do you have the source code? And will you let me uh, get it off those rotting disks and and save this stuff? Because uh, this this software is relative is basically unknown, and and uh, I'm sure the Atari community would love to see it and learn from it. Um, sure. Um, yeah, I sort of thought about it when you mentioned it before. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure why you want it. Um, but sure. <laughs> uh, it's, I, so I do have, I did save a set of the documentation. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm sure I have, I'm sure I have an executable disc. A couple of them. I not. I probably have a source on a floppy somewhere, but I really would have to dig for it because I don't know where. Okay. Um. And uh, yeah, it's. I mean, I, I. It's not something that I probably would consciously throw away because I spend a lot of time and energy <laughs> on it. I still have a. I still have in my in my cabinet somewhere the first program that I wrote on uh, IBM 360 at UCLA. Hmm. It's a deck of uh, like 200 punch cards. Uh -huh. <laughs> What's the program? <laughs> and, and I and that's totally unusable. I don't, I don't know of anybody that has a punch card reader. <laughs> um, so I can't imagine, if I have that, I can't imagine I threw away a floppy disk <laughs> as a source for the automated library too. What was your program um, so that, probably that took 200 cards? Yeah. Well, what was it? Yeah. It was a pro it was a program that did uh, played 3D tic tac toe. Oh, cool. On a a four by four by four matrix. It was a uh, for an automated, um, sorry, artificial intelligence class. Hmm. Uh, it was an interesting program because it beat me reliably, but it couldn't beat some other people. So it was apparently very highly tuned for the way I play 3D. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, anyway, yeah, I can try and dig up that floppy if I, if there's only a few places it could be. I would, I would love that. And in answer to your question, why? I mean, there, there are a bunch of us uh, who love these computers and we're trying to collect all of the software. I mean, just like, let's find everything ever written and get it in one place. And, and, uh, um, before the floppy disks rot away. And it's, it's always super exciting when, when we discover something that is basically unknown. I mean, I'm sorry, you only sold seven copies of your, of your program. No, yeah, you're exactly <laughs> right. It was basically unknown. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, yeah, you're right. It's, it, I mean, I didn't sell very many and it wasn't very well known. I advertised it for a while. Uh, actually, I spent like probably... Five or six thousand dollars, which was a lot for a student at the time yeah. doing advertising. I'm going to uh, see if I can find that ad. You said in School Library Journal, right? Yep. All right, I'll, I'll try to see if I can find it. So you lost money on this thing, then? I mean, between the, the cost of yep. the ads and everything. Yep. Yeah, I lost money. I didn't lose a ton of money yep. because I was very risk averse. So I I I spent like three or four thousand dollars and on ads and I sold like 10 systems. I only, I think I reduced the price to only five. Actually I made some money. So I made more money on it. So it was a weird thing. Um, the labels that it required for the books were big labels because it didn't, it wasn't, the system was not uh, engineered so that there was just a number in the book. And a, and a number for the student ID mm -hmm. and then the database would correlate the number with who that really was or what book that really was. Mm -hmm. That's how the other systems worked. So the, 
because I was running off a of floppy, I knew I didn't have a ton of room for lots of storage, if that makes sense. Sure. So I didn't, so I didn't store the name and copy number and price and author of every book in the library on floppy disk. So when you check out a book, if you wanted to know what book it was, the, the title, the author, the copy number, and the price all had to be encoded in the barcode. Oh. So in order to get all of that information in the barcode, it was kind of a big barcode. And so it had to be printed on a big label, which was a little bit hard to get. Not, not really hard, just you couldn't buy them at the local stationery store. So I bought them from um, Avery Label Direct, and they, the, a box of 5,000 labels cost me like $35. And I was, so I admit to being naive and young and foolish. And I thought I was a software engineer. So I was trying to sell these systems for $700. And, and the people that did buy them came to me and said, uh, okay, we bought this system. We, we need labels. So book libraries have, you know, uh, 30, 40,000 books in them. Um, so a library would buy, would want like, uh, eight or nine boxes of these labels. And I didn't want to be in that business. So I said, well, you know, they would come to me and say, we want to buy a box of labels from you. And I go, well, okay, but I don't really want to do this. So I'll sell them to you for a hundred dollars as an incentive. I thought to make them go directly to Avery and buy them directly for $35. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, but strangely they kept buying them for me. They said, okay, hundred dollars for a box of labels. That's fine. So I, so I sold this, the software for, um, I dropped the price to 500, I think at one point 500, but then I made more than $500 in selling labels to everybody <laughs> that bought a system, which, which I didn't really figure out until it was way too late, but I should have just said, Hey, you know what? I'm going to drop the price of the software to $10. Um, but you got to buy a label for me. <laughs> Should have gone with the, <laughs> the, the, the cheap razors, uh, expensive blades system, right? Exactly. <laughs> and, I was, and I was an MBA student, so I should have figured that out. <laughs> but I didn't. I forget how I got off on that tangent. I asked you if you made money on this. Oh, yeah. So, so got close to breaking even what was the sales of the extra labels. Um, but didn't really make money. So, but it was an interesting experiment. Sure. I guess. Awesome. And you helped your mom, and that's important too. She loved the system. She was really, I mean, she was proud of me because, you know, it's my mom. <laughs> but um, she, was, she, was, she was really a pioneer uh, in LA City Schools libraries. She was the first one to have an automated managed library management system and um, kind of really broke ground for the whole school system. Amazing. So, yeah. Good for her. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, good for her. I mean, she, she put up with a, she put up with a lot of beta copies. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think this is my last question. Uh, this sure. This podcast is listened to by people who still love this computer. And uh, so if you could send them a message, and you can right now, what would you tell them? Um, I love Ataris. I think they were awesome computers at the time. Uh, super fun to program. I loved programming on it. Uh, I don't know how many of your you, your listeners are programmers um, or just people who play with them, but, um, it was a great computer and I wish that they had been more successful. Mm -hmm. I was, I almost cried the day I heard that they bulldozed thousands of Atari 400s into a landfill. Yeah. Um, but I just, I just, I couldn't believe that they would do that. I just go, give those computers to somebody who can use them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. 
Um, yeah, so they're super fun computers. I don't, I have, I still have mine. Oh. It's in a cabinet somewhere. I haven't pulled it out in over a decade because, I mean, I program, I'm a professional software engineer, so um, I program on mostly on PCs now. Um, and they are, you know, I, I would find it constraining to try to get a 6502 to do the kind of stuff that I work on now. Yeah, it'll probably but be tricky. I really, I, yeah, I don't really, I don't really program. I don't touch it anymore. Uh, but I do remember those days really fondly when, uh, I mean, it, it was kind of the, the pioneer days for personal computing. Mm-hmm. And it was really exciting. It was a, really a lot of fun to um, program to, to sort of be at the forefront of uh, a, a revolution in the in the way we deal with information and technology. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks, Greg. I appreciate your time tonight. Cool. All I'll right. talk to you later. If you enjoy these interviews and would like to contribute, there are two ways you can help. You can help fund these interviews directly by contributing to my Patreon. A small monthly contribution will help offset the expenses of making these oral history interviews. Contribute at patreon.com slash savits. Or make a tax-deductible contribution to the Internet Archive, a nonprofit digital library that has done incredible things to preserve computer history. Make your tax-deductible contribution at archive.org slash donate. Thanks.